Good afternoon. The South Dakota Senate will come to order, and I'm really pleased to welcome back Father Ron Gary of the St. John's Catholic Church uh, to pray for and over and with us. He's with the ministerium here and has been with us for a number of years, and we're sure grateful to have you back, Father. We have two pages of the day, Aspen Stover from Hot Springs and Dylan Gerlach from Mount Vernon to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Thanks be to God whose love has gathered us this day. Thanks be to God who helps and guides us on our way. Thanks be to God for all the gifts of light and life. Thanks be to God who care protects us day and night. Thanks be to God who knows our secret joys and fears. Thanks be to God who, when we call him, always hears. Oh, give us, Lord, the grace to do all things that show our love of you. Amen. Secretary, will you please call the roll? Senator Boland, Kamak, Cronin, Kurd, Ewing, Frerichs, Greenfield, Haverly, Heiner, Jensen, Kennedy, Killer, Klum, Kolbeck, Langer, Mahar, Monroe, Nelson, Nessaba, Netherton, Northrop, Otten, Partridge, Peters, Rush, Russell, Sohold, Solano, Stalzer, Sutton, Tapio, Tiedemann, White, Wick, and Youngberg. We have a quorum, Mr. President. Approval of the journal, please. Mr. President, the Committee on Legislative Procedure respectfully reports that the Secretary of the Senate has had under consideration the Senate Journal of the 10th day. All errors, typographical or otherwise, are duly marked in the temporary journal for correction, and we hereby move the adoption of the report. Respectfully submitted, Senator Greenfield, Chair. Is there a second? All those in favor signify by saying aye. Those opposed, nay. Motion carried. Well, we're going to pause here and welcome everybody to this beautiful Wednesday in your state capitol. And welcome you to your state senate. On behalf of the senators and me, it's uh, grateful that you're here physically. And those individuals who are watching on public broadcasting and live streams so that we can connect with you today. We specifically uh, like to individually recognize uh, Gregory High School senior class. Where are you? Right here. Is Cade there or is he hiding? He, Cade, our former page, made a bad decision. That's kind of, that's too bad, Cade. Um, anyway, that will affect his uh, recommendations for college, but don't, don't tell him, okay. Anyway, we're sure glad to hear you. Gregory High School, senior class, thank you for being here. And what's really nice is they're sponsored by uh, the American Legion, Hutchison Post 6 in Gregory, Commander Richard Schaefer, and they sponsor it. And we uh, also, uh, Paige Santana Matuka is the granddaughter of Commander Schaefer. What a great day. So thank you, uh, American Legion, Hutchison County. like to point out, although I believe that they have left uh, the Pharmacy Association, I think you saw the pharmacists around, that's such a dynamic group every time they come uh, doing the health screenings today and also, yeah, the opportunity to speak with them. Really an impressive group and especially at SDSU how that has grown and uh, necessarily as our complex medical system has, has undergone uh, many changes. So. On behalf of Senator Tiedemann and all of us, if you're listening, and if not, uh, please know our well wishes to the South Dakota Pharmacy Association for doing that. Um, I also see, uh, is Dr. Heinemann up here? I can't, he's not over here yet. We'll introduce Dr. Heinemann. I think we all know Dan when he comes. I do see uh, Representative Senator, Representative and Senator Frank Klocek here. Good to see you, Frank. Senator Haverly. Thank you, Mr. President. Members of the Senate, in particular Pages, Gregory High School, I'd like to introduce my beautiful daughter, Samantha Haverly. She is here 
um, at a career fair. She's a missions counselor at the South Dakota School of Mines and Technology. For anybody who's interested in this, you might want to visit with her. I also want to state, she was a page many years ago, probably more than she wants me to tell. She still keeps in contact with um, her other page friends um, So to this day. So I think these are lifelong um, friendships that a lot of you develop, and, and she's proof of it. So thanks for joining us today. Good to see you, Amanda. Your mother consistently and persistently tells us that you've got her genes, right? Not your dad's, right? So. <laughs> Second. <laughs> um, also, please, uh, it's confidential, don't tell anybody that today is Carol Nowak's birthday. Okay. <laughs> Woo! Carol! The great news for anyone else who has gone back to the house or seen them, we do not sing because applause is quicker, but we love you even more, Carol. Congratulations. And uh, Senator Kamak, welcome back, sir. Thank you, Mr. President. I, I want to say that uh, the uh, hole in the heart of our family will never be filled after the passing of my sister Elaine. But we'll get through it with the support of family. And the support of my legislative family has been overwhelming. And I want to take this moment to thank every one of you, uh, staff, uh, legislators from both sides of the House, and it only reinforces the fact that uh, I truly believe that you are my family. So thank you very much. You and Elena and family are in our prayers constantly, so thank you. Any other personal privileges that I missed? Okay, so for the students, obviously everyone, we have preliminary work to do. A lot of it we have to do because the Constitution says everything is open so that you can't hide anything, and that's really what we love about our state. Now we do it by computer so people know what's actually occurring, but we still have to comply with reading a number of things because people were up there trying to keep track of, of bills and what committees were doing, and that was all, all done orally, and people would keep track of that with notepads and a thing called a pencil. And uh, so that's what we will be doing, although it may appear people aren't paying attention because we're not. Uh, we just have to put this into the record, and we'll be getting to some real work here in a bit. So our next order of business, and it's all sequential, so our next order of business is communications and petitions. I have a letter to the president from the attorney general's office, and is, it's uh, pursuant to the provisions of the South Dakota codified laws, and subject to your consent, I have the honor to inform you that I have appointed Ann Cannon Hayek to the South Dakota Board of Pardons and Paroles. This appointment is effective January 23rd, 2018, and will expire January 17th, 2022. And this is from the Attorney General, Marty Jackley. So the Attorney General, uh, just like the Supreme Court Justice, uh, Chief Justice, and the Governor have the ability to appoint under law certain, certain positions, and then the Senate, just like the federal government Senate, has the ability to investigate, interview, and agree or disagree with this appointment. The Attorney General is appointing Ann Hayek to the Board of Pardons and Paroles, and the President Pro Tem has referred this to the Judiciary Committee for hearing. Next up is reports of select committees. The Committee on Transportation reports that it has had under consideration House Bill 1069 and recommends due pass, Senator Frerichs, acting chair. The Committee on Local Government has had under consideration House Bill 1013, recommends due pass, and Senate Bill 86 and House Bill 1011 recommends due pass to be placed on the consent calendar, Senator Langer, chair. The Committee on Taxation has had under consideration Senate Bill 90, recommends due pass to be placed on the consent calendar, Senator Monroe Chair. 
Committee on Health and Human Services has had under consideration House Bills 1019, 1021, and 1040, recommending do pass. Senate Bill 105 recommends do pass as amended. And House Bill 1020 recommends amending the bill and then placing it on the consent calendar. Senator Sohold, Chair. And the Committee on State Affairs has had under consideration SJR 2 and House Bill 10. 01 and 1003 and 1006 recommends do pass and then they recommend referring Senate Bill 2 to the joint to to joint appro joint appropriations Okay, I have a correction here from uh, the, the Health and Human Services Committee, uh, House Bill 1020 is just due pass consent. and placed on the consent calendar. It was not amended. And I misspoke. This is a report of standing committees. This is what the committees did today. Again, uh, we have this on our computer. We need to do it publicly. Messages, please. Mr. President, I have the honor to transmit House Bill 1009, 1016, 1029, 1031, 1050, 1058, 1084, 1086, 1087, and 1100, which have passed the House, and your favorable consideration is requested. Respectfully, Sandra J. Zinter, Chief Clerk. Okay, now on to some activity. Motions and resolutions, please. House Concurrent Resolution 1002, a concurrent resolu resolution recognizing the great need and offering support for additional mental health services in Western South Dakota. Senator Partridge moves that HCR 1002 is found on page 110 of the House Journal be adopted. Is there a second? Before I introduce Senator Partridge, this is a resolution. They uh, do not have the power of law but is done for the purpose of expressing the intent or opinions of the legislature to the audience. In this case, this is coming over from the House. Senator Partridge is the sponsor of this to dialogue, this asking the Senate whether or not they wish to join in concurrence on this uh, resolution. Senator Partridge, welcome. Thank you, Mr. President. It doesn't always work out, but when possible, we like to have a plan a plan in place, a comprehensive plan, and the need for mental health, West River is no exception. I therefore would like to read our House Concurrent Resolution that I've been working with Representative Johns on, as well as many members of uh, our community, uh, great, not just Rapid City, but the entire region, um, in working with regional health and law enforcement um, on this issue. A concurrent resolution recognizing the great need and offering support for additional mental health services in Western South Dakota. Whereas South Dakota is experiencing a mental health crisis and the state is, is one in five states that allow a person experiencing a mental health crisis to be held in a correctional facility. And whereas mental illness and substance use disorders are treatable health conditions but often persons in crisis end up at an emergency room in the custody of criminal justice system. And whereas the organizations who deal with this issue in the state strongly urge the state of South Dakota increases the level of resources provided to accomplish the goal of establishing additional mental health services in Western South Dakota, including consideration of a second human services center. And whereas Western South Dakota would benefit from additional services that could provide a continuum of care for people in need of mental health services that would be less costly than jails, emergency rooms, or traveling across the state for services. And whereas the current Human Service Center located in Yankton is a significant geographic barrier for anyone in need of services who is from West River as it removes the person from his or her core support system and familiar setting. And whereas additional mental health services in Western South Dakota would fill serious gaps in care location, resources, and services available for safety and appropriate treatment for persons suffering from mental health, health issues. I urge your support and favorable consideration of this resolution. Thank you, Senator Partridge. Good afternoon, Senator Solano. Good to see you, sir. 
Good afternoon, Mr. President. Um, thank you uh, for the opportunity to speak on this. And I'll be very brief, but um, the good senator from Pennington County, uh, I think, stated it very well at the beginning that it's important to have a plan. And I think that this is a good first step on uh, bringing attention to, to needs that, that are there as it relates to mental health. Uh, but we need to get to the next step of that plan, and that will be to really start taking a look at in South Dakota from a population health standpoint and understanding better uh, what it is that we need as it relates to inpatient psychiatric care, the number of psychiatrists that we need, uh, and those kinds of things. We've got a good... Uh, uh, a history of that when we had done the long range uh, or the long term care study. And so I'm hopeful that, that this will lead to the conversations that we need to have on what can we do as a state to, to get a funding mechanism uh, so that we can take a look at a population health study that will help drive um, that plan uh, as the good senator stated. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Solano. Further remarks? Senator Tapio. Good afternoon, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I too am concerned about the future of mental health care, uh, as well as uh, a, a very large host of other issues that are affecting our state. Uh, I think that we have a, a, a real crisis uh, when it comes to uh, drug abuse, drug addiction, uh, mental health challenges. Uh, and they start at a very, very early age, and I think it's important to identify clearly uh, what, um, what, what, is, what is affecting our society and, because of that, our budgets to be able to treat those problems. One of the things that I was very concerned about was uh, we have a, fam a familiar uh, resource in western South Dakota already, as the, the, represent or the senator from Pennington County alluded to, that maybe we need a resource over in the western South Dakota. We already have that, and it's called Star Academy, and it houses up to 200 and some uh, people in that facility. Uh, there are state resources that are already available that may be utilized to be able to uh, accommodate uh, the desires uh, and the needs that our state has. Thank you. Thank you. Further remarks? Hearing none, the question before uh, the Senate is Senator Partridge's motion that HCR 1002 be concurred in. Those in favor of concurring with the House in this resolution will vote aye. Those opposed to concurrence will vote no. Madam Secretary, will you please call the roll? Senator Boland? Mack? Aye. Cronin? Aye. Kurd? Aye. Ewing? Aye. Frerichs? Aye. Greenfield? Aye. Haverly? Aye. Heinert? Aye. Jensen? Aye. Kennedy? Aye. Killer? Aye. Klum? Aye. Kobeck? Aye. Langer? Aye. Maher? Aye. Monroe? Aye. Nelson? Aye. Nesaba? Netherton? Aye. Nordstrup? Aye. Otten? Aye. Partridge? Aye. Peters? Aye. Rush? Aye. Russell? Aye. Soholt? Aye. Solano? Aye. Stalzer? Aye. Sutton? Aye. Tapio? Aye. Tiedemann? Aye. White? Aye. Wick? Aye. Youngberg? Aye. Jensen? Mr. President, there are 33 yeas, two nays. Senator Partridge's motion that HCR 1002 be concurred in, having received a majority vote of the members elect, is hereby declared passed. And HCR 1002 is so concurred in by the Senate. Senate Concurrent Resolution Number 6, a concurrent resolution recognizing the 70th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights on December 10th, 2018, and the celebration of Human Rights Day. President Pro Tem has waived a committee referral, and this will be placed on tomorrow's calendar. Next is a Senate, Senate Resolution 1. 
a resolution confirming the legitimacy of and South Dakota's support for the 1868 Treaty of Fort Laramie. Committee hearing has been waived and this will be placed on our hearing, excuse me, calendar for tomorrow. Senator Curd moves that when we adjourn today, we adjourn to convene at 1 p.m. on Thursday, January 25th, the 12th legislative day. All those in favor of that motion signify by saying aye. aye. Those opposed, nay. Motion carried. Okay, now we have consideration of committee reports. Senator Curd moves that the report of the Standing Committee on Education on Senate Bill 19 and Senate Bills 19 and 94 and the reports of the Committee on Judiciary on Senate Bill 62 and Senate Bill 84 of the Senate Journal be adopted. Is there a second? All those in favor of adoption signify by saying aye. Those opposed nay. Motion carried. Our next order of business is consent calendar. We have two bills that passed out of the respective committees unanimously. Uh, excuse me. I'm sorry, first reading of Senate bill, so I jumped too, too ahead. I'm gonna join up. Okay, I apologize. It's caffeine talking again. We need to read these in open session for the reason I've explained to you, although we won't be paying attention. It was so people could keep track of what the name of the bill is, what the number of the bill is, and then where this is assigned for committee so it couldn't be lost or hidden or other nefarious or bad acts. And so we do this in computer, but uh, we need to do this by virtue of the Constitution orally, so our team up here will read them at the same time for efficiency purposes. Please proceed. Senate Bill 125, an act to clarify the authority of the Government Operations and Audit Committee to issue a subpoena. 128, an act to revise certain provisions regarding ballot question committees. 129, an act to revise certain limitations and penalties concerning campaign contributions. 133, an act to revise the retention of state fiscal records, Senate Bill 144, an act to revise certain provisions related to party affiliation on voter registration cards, Senate Bill 127, an act to revise certain requirements for a proposed wind, wind energy facility applicant, Senate Bill 135, an act to revise certain provisions regarding the collection of confidential communications records, Senate Bill 138, an act to revise certain provisions regarding the appointment of wind energy tax revenue to school districts. Senate Bill 145, an act to revise certain provisions related to claims regarding workers' compensation. Senate Bill 131, an act to create the Career and Technical Education Consortium Grant Program and Career and Technical Education Consortium Fund. Senate Bill 132, an act to establish the Early Learning Advisory Council. Senate Bill 142, an act to authorize an apt out of school board approved installment purchase contracts, lease purchase contracts or capital outlay certificates. And Senate Bill 148, an act to revise the list of organizations that may approve and accredit a non-public school. These bills are assigned to respective committees as follows. Uh, Agriculture and Natural Resources 137, Commerce 127, 135, 138, 145, Education 131, 132, 142 excuse me, 132, 142, 148, Health and Human Services, 141. Joint Appropriations, 130, 134, Judiciary, 139, 140, Local Government, 126, 147, 149, State Affairs, 125, 128, 129, 133, 144, Transportation, 136 and 146, and Retirement Laws, we'll hear Senate Bill 143. Same drill for first reading of House Bills. House Bill 1009, an act to revise certain provisions regarding the administration of benefits provided to veterans. 1016, an act to revise certain provisions regarding the authorization to provide post-secondary education. House Bill 1029, an act to increase certain fees for self-insurance by employers. House Bill 1031, an act to revise certain provisions and references regarding real estate licensing. House Bill 1050, an act to revise certain provisions regarding the Prompt Payment Act. House Bill 1058, an act to revise provisions regarding the employment of the Superintendent of the State School for the Deaf and the South Dakota School for the Blind and Visually Impaired. House Bill 1084, an act to revise certain provisions regarding garnishment disclosure forms. 1086, an act to exempt certain assisted living facilities from the salon license requirement. House Bill 1087, an act to allow certain students to test for cosmetologists 
esthetician and nail technician licensure, and finally, House Bill 1100, an act to require a name be printed on public contracts. President Pro Tem has assigned uh, the bills to these respective committees. Commerce will hear House Bills 1029, 1031, 1050, 1086, 1087, Education 1016, 1058, Judiciary 1084, and 1100. Military and Veterans Affairs will have a hearing on House Bill 1009. Okay, now we're up to me, and that is where I was on consent calendar. Consent calendar, again, we have two bills today that passed out of committee unanimously uh, yesterday, and uh, this is an efficiency mechanism. They're not subject to debate. We'll get to our debate calendar in a minute, but questions may be asked, or any individual senator may remove the bill for debate tomorrow. Not hearing that and not seeing that, we'll proceed with a consent calendar voting uh, and hearing on the two bills, Senate Bill 30 and 71. Please proceed. Senate Bill 30, an act to provide for the regulation of microblading by municipalities and Senate Bill 71, an act to revise certain provisions related to a license renewal for the practice of medicine, osteopathy, surgery, or obstetrics. Thank you so much. Uh, House, excuse me, Senate Bills 30 and 71, having received a second reading, are up for consideration and final passage. Any questions, Senators, on either one of these bills? Hearing none, the question before the Senate's final passage of Senate Bills 30 and 71. Those in favor will vote aye. Those opposed nay. Madam Secretary, please call the roll. Senator Bolin. Aye. Kamak? Aye. Cronin? Aye. Kurd? Aye. Ewing? Aye. Frerichs? Aye. Greenfield? Aye. Haverly? Aye. Heinert? Jensen, Aye. Kennedy, Hiller, Plum, Kobeck, Langer, Aye. Mahar, Aye. Monroe, Aye. Nelson, Aye. Nesabeth, Aye. Netherton, Aye. Nordstrup, Aye. Otten, Aye. Partridge, Aye. Peters, Aye. Rush, Aye. Russell, Aye. Soholt, Aye. Solano, Aye. Stalzer? Aye. Sutton? Aye. Tapio? Aye. Tiedemann? Aye. White? Aye. Wick? Aye. Youngberg? Youngberg? Aye. Mr. President, there are 35 yeas. Senate Bills 30 and 71, having received a majority vote of the members elected, hereby declared passed. Any questions on either of these titles? I shall approve the titles. Okay, Senators, we're on to our debate calendar. Please proceed. Second reading of Senate bills. Senate Bill 77, an act to revise certain provisions regarding required campaign finance disclosure statements submitted by ballot question committees. Senate Bill 77, having received a second reading, is up for consideration and final passage. Good afternoon, Senator Nesiba. You've already had a busy day. Good to see you. It, it has been a busy day, Mr. President, um, but, a, but a pleasant one. Uh, I bring to you today um, Senate Bill 77. Uh, this is not a bill. This bill did not come out of the Initiative Measure Task Force. Uh, it was an idea that came to my attention um, after that period, but you will notice that, uh, that Senator Otten, Senator Bolin uh, do serve as co-sponsors on that as do uh, representatives uh, Peterson and Reed on the, uh, on the House side. Um, this bill does one simple thing. What it does is it adds one additional disclosure for ballot question committees during the year in which petition signatures are being gathered. Right now, the Secretary of State's office is uh, continuing uh, to, uh, to approve various measures for the ballot, but many of them, we don't know who paid for them because their finance report isn't due until Friday. And so what this does is it asks that on July 1st, in the year uh, when those uh, petitions are being circulated, we'd find out who is actually paying for those. So it increases transparency, uh, gives us one more disclosure, gives us more information about who's putting these issues on the ballot uh, in front of the people of South Dakota, and I'd really urge your support for this bill. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you so much, Senator. Further remarks? Hearing none, the question before the Senate's final passage of Senate Bill 77. Those in favor will vote aye. Those opposed nay. Madam Secretary, please call the roll. Senator Bolin? Aye. Kamak? Aye. Cronin? Aye. Kurd? Aye. Ewing? Aye. Frerichs? Aye. Greenfield? 
Haverly? Aye. Heinert? Aye. Jensen? No. Kennedy? Aye. Killer? Aye. Plum? Aye. Kobeck? Aye. Langer? Aye. Maher? Aye. Monroe? Aye. Nelson? Aye. Nessaba? Aye. Netherton? Aye. Nordstrup? Aye. Otten? Aye. Partridge? Aye. Peters? Aye. Rush? Aye. Russell? Aye. Sohold? Aye. Solano? Aye. Stalzer? Aye. Sutton? Aye. Tapio? Aye. Tiedemann? Aye. White? Aye. Wick? Aye. Youngberg? Aye. Mr. President, there are 33 yeas, two nays. Thank you, Senate Bill 77. Having received majority vote of the members elect to serve by declare passed. Title questions? Hearing none, I'll approve the title. Senate Bill 25, an act to revise certain fees for entities permitted under the National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System. I'm just going to wait for them to clear, Jace. Yep, that's yeah. fine. Okay, thank you for your patience. Senate Bill 25, having received a second reading, is up for consideration and final passage. Good afternoon, Senator Frerichs. A good topic for you to discuss with us. Hey, you betcha. Thank you, Mr. President. And members of the Senate, on behalf of the Department of Environment and Natural Resources, we have before us Senate Bill 25. And I ask for you to please just take a moment to, uh, you know, kind of walk with me a little bit. Uh, on this bill because obviously when we want to talk about water and we uh, have the issues of safe water and everything else, it, it truly affects all of us. And the bill that we have before us in Senate Bill 25 is really our way here in South Dakota of saying that we want to handle our issues in terms of, of the way that that water leaves our facilities. And when I say that, it's a very loose term meaning whether the cities or, or agriculture areas or wherever, that we want to take care of it here in South Dakota instead of having the EPA come in and take care of that uh, and have obviously their own way of, of doing things. So Senate Bill 25 is, is really uh, dealing with permits uh, and it's, uh, it hasn't been updated for a number of years. I think it looks like 26 years ago is what DNR, DNR shares with us. Uh, they issue these permits to cities, industries, and construction sites to limit and control the amount of pollution discharged into rivers, streams, and lakes. Um, obviously, the current fees no longer support the program in terms of making sure that they can uh, do the spot checking and have the necessary staff. Um, they've had to leave some positions vacant in the past, and that's why they're bringing this fee increase in front of all of us. I also want to reassure you before I go uh, into the details as far as the three main points of the bill, there's a lady by the name of Kelly Busher who works for DNR, and, and some of you have probably had the chance to meet her. Uh, she's worked really hard uh, to go out and, and share with the stakeholders on what DNR is proposing to do with this fee increase, and she has been met with a lot of support out there. And so they've done their due diligence, and I applaud them for that effort. Uh, obviously, the Municipal League and all of the members in terms of various cities uh, were the main focus of, of why they want to share this message, so they've been made aware, certainly counties. And then if you keep going further, uh, some of the other stakeholders would include, obviously, general contractors, home builders association. Uh, and then you can go right down the list in terms of agriculture stakeholders that have an interest in this area uh, because their members uh, will be affected by the change in these permit fees. Um, the three main points that I uh, shared or, or that uh, I want you to uh, be aware of as far as what's in the bill. One, it, it uh, bases the fee structure for discharge permits issued to municipal water treatment plants on the current federal census instead of the 1990 census, so obviously that's important. We know that our cities have grown, uh, in, especially in, the, in the, the bigger cities, so it's important that we have current data. 
and obviously the cities that have experienced the growth are going to pay a higher fee. That's just the way it works when you have more people in a certain area. Uh, the second part, it establishes a new tiered fee system for stormwater control permits for construction sites, which is based on the size of the site in terms of acres. And so uh, if anybody uh, wants a comparison as far as how large an acre is, it's basically the size of a football field. So I know Senator Cronin already knows uh, how big that may be, and certainly the acres on his farm, uh, you know, he has to cover a few, few more just because of the territory they have compared to over in my area, but the uh, size of a football field uh, it would be uh, one acre. And uh, lastly, the third part it authorizes DENR to use the administrative rules process to develop tiered fees for stormwater control permits for industrial sites. As I shared with you, the DENR spent the last six months meeting with and getting stakeholder input. And um, we, uh, it says here in the notes from DENR that they want to remind all of you that these fees do not uh, grow state government. They simply allow DENR to fill existing positions that are necessary to keep delegation of the program. If these fees are not approved, DENR may be forced to give the permitting program back to the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency in Denver, Colorado, or Washington, D.C. Losing delegation of this program to EPA would be bad for our waters, bad for our local governments, bad for our industries, and bad for our economy. Mr. President, uh, on behalf of the Senate Agriculture Committee, where we gave unanimous support to Senate Bill 25, uh, I ask for the entire Senate body's support for the bill that's before us. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Ferrix. Further remarks? Hearing none, uh, I'm sorry, Senator Tapio, thank you. A question for the previous speaker. Please state your question, sir. Thank you. Uh, so the, the, the fee for uh, stormwater drainage would be a new fee. Is that accurate? Is that how the, I read the bill? Senator Ferrix, do you care to answer the question? Mr. President, I would ask for a little clarification, if I may. Please, uh, restate your question. Senator Tapio. No, and, Thank and, you. And I, could I ask for clear? I have a little more question on the clarification. Aye, aye. Okay. Yep, you could. Thank you, Mr. President. And, and Senator, I'm just curious, you mean uh, stormwater for cities or for construction sites? Uh, I'm, I'm just asking in which area. Thank you. Senator Tapio. Okay, yes. Uh, it would be for construction sites in page 3, uh, line 24. Uh, it says that a fee for a construction site that is required to operate under a general water pollution control permit, uh, and then it follows up on uh, the next page, line eight, uh, kind of elaborates on that. Uh, so this, I believe, is a new fee. Is that accurate? Senator Ferris, do you wish to answer the question? And Mr. President, thank you, and, and thank you to the good senator from Watertown for his question. And, and, and he's correct. The, uh, if you look at the entire section three, um, it's obviously inserting a, a new section. So construction sites, and as I was giving the comparison in terms of at least an acre uh, in size and larger is my understanding, they will be subject to this fee. And obviously there are, um, part of that permit is that they have the necessary uh, barriers in place. You see the, uh, um, they're like small little round bales. And I don't know if some of you, I know my, I think my dad is listening and he, it always points out this older small round baler, but they don't use those anymore. But you see the bales and, and various structures used to keep the water that is on that site to try to keep it there or at least filter it before it leaves those construction sites. So that would be one area where we would uh, see that, that this uh, uh, fee will be administered to make sure they follow that permit process. Thank you, Thank Senator you. Tapio. You have the floor, sir. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, I uh, have, have had several occupations in my life, but one of them, I've built about 30 spec homes in the Sioux Falls market, and my entire family are, is involved in the development of property. And uh, what's amazing about South Dakota is that there's very few regulations to develop property, and it's one of the reasons why we want to uh, you know, keep uh, as many regulations as possible out of our, our statutes. I don't have a problem with uh, 
assessing necessary uh, regular uh, fees for uh, development. One of the difficulties of development is that you have to get a sewer permit, a water permit, and you go through a, an entire list of, of, uh, of uh, uh, utilities, uh, different um, uh, departments that you have to get uh, regulations and, and approval from. My concern is, is that we're going to categorize one little fee uh, that is a part of a larger uh, sewer and water treatment fee. And it appears to me that, um, that it might be possible, and I, I haven't uh, researched this enough, uh, but it might be possible to, uh, uh, instead of having a separate fee, to include it in the general uh, larger fee within that area that you get your uh, permit from. So that would be my concern. I don't have an answer to that. If somebody would be able to further elaborate, I would be more than happy to uh, um, uh, uh, discuss that, but that's just my concern. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Further remarks? Hearing no further remarks, uh, this does uh, create a new fee. It also, especially for our interns that keep track of this, it does go into a separate sub fund that, as you heard Senator Freire's talk about, that will operate that program in appropriations that's called other funds. But it requires under our Constitution a two-thirds majority vote because it will not be under our general bill. So it has a new fee, it will be a continuous appropriation, and therefore requires a two-thirds majority vote. Question before the Senate's final passage of Senate Bill 25. Those in favor will vote aye. Those opposed nay. Madam Secretary, please call the roll. Senator Bolin. Aye. Kamak? Aye. Cronin? Aye. Kurd? Aye. Ewing? Aye. Frerichs? Aye. Greenfield? Aye. Haverly? Aye. Heinert? Aye. Jensen? Kennedy, Aye. Killer, Aye. Klum, Aye. Kobeck, Aye. Langer, Aye. Mahar, Aye. Monroe, Aye. Nelson, Nesaba, Netherton, Aye. Nordstrup, Aye. Otten, Aye. Partridge, Aye. Peters, Aye. Rush, Aye. Russell, Soholt? Aye. Solano? Aye. Dalzer? Aye. Sutton? Aye. Tapio? No. Tiedemann? Aye. White? Aye. Wick? Aye. Youngberg? Aye. Mr. President, there are 30 yeas, 5 nays. Senate Bill 25 having received two-thirds majority vote of the members elect is hereby declared passed. Any questions on this title? I don't see any, and therefore I approve it. Before we come to the next bill, truly one of the greatest honors, as I think you know, is I get to introduce individuals from here on your behalf and all of ours. Today, our doctor of the day, we thank him for being here, but also the last uh, two days, uh, we didn't have a doctor of the day, so we all uh, stored up all of our illnesses, Dr. Dan, just for you. Uh, but Dan Heidemann is not only, I mean, they give me a resume, but I've known him for a long time. He is a family practice, <clears throat> excuse me, he's an internal med doc. But, you know, one of the things about Dac, uh, Dr. Heineman, when I first met him, he's an FP, I'm sorry, but same deal in the amount of work that he's done. Uh, prior to his administrative role at Sanford as vice president and medical officer, uh, also he's been a leader in uh, medical education and has taken a strong lead with a number of people through our medical school at the university and also other people to expand that and work on our primary care work. Uh, Dr. Dan, before Heinemann, before that, was practicing in Canton uh, in this role, and he's obviously still practicing. So we really appreciate you being here, and especially as a South Dakota product, showing how many individuals can be here and uh, taking care of us. So grateful for that, and as a brother of the brush, welcome. Thank you again, doctor. Okay, 34. Senate Bill 34, an act to revise certain provisions regarding registration for pesticide products. Senate Bill 34, I haven't received a second reading, is up for consideration and final passage. Senator Rotten, good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon, Mr. President. Currently, all pesticides for sale in South Dakota, they must be registered with the South Dakota Department of Agriculture. 
we have a biannual registration fee of $240, meaning it's being paid well, every two years. South Dakota is one of the few states that has biannual rather than annual. So what we're going to end up doing here is this bill here was going to split it. We're going to now pay it annually, which is $120. So nothing's being raised. It is just logistically better for businesses to be able to write one check. And then that same business as he's writing it, you know, to whether it be North Dakota, Minnesota or whatnot, that it matches with us. And so with that, I would ask for your support. Thank you, sir. Further remarks? As Senator pointed out, this is not a fee increase, therefore is a majority vote. Question before the Senate's final passage of Senate Bill 34. Those in favor will vote aye. Those opposed nay. Madam Secretary, please call the roll. Senator Bolin? Aye. Kamak? Aye. Cronin? Aye. Kurd? Aye. Ewing? Aye. Frerichs? Aye. Greenfield? Aye. Haverly? Aye. Heinert? Aye. Jensen? Aye. Kennedy? Aye. Killer? Plum, Aye. Kobeck, Aye. Langer, Aye. Mahar, Aye. Monroe, Aye. Nelson, Aye. Nessaba, Aye. Netherton, Aye. Nordstrup, Aye. Otten, Aye. Partridge, Aye. Peters, Aye. Rush, Aye. Russell, Aye. Soholt, Aye. Solano, Aye. Stalzer, Aye. Sutton, Tapio? Aye. Tiedemann? Aye. White? Aye. Wick? Aye. Youngberg? Aye. Mr. President, there are 35 yeas. Thank you. Senate Bill 34, having received a majority vote of the members elect, is hereby declared passed. Any title questions? I'll approve that then. SJR. Senate Joint Resolution Number 1, a joint resolution proposing and submitting to the le electors at the next general election an amendment to the Constitution of the State of South Dakota relating to amendments to the Constitution. This Chair 1, uh, having received uh, second reading, is up for consideration and final passage. Good afternoon, Senator Boland. Thank you, Mr. President. Today I bring you, fellow members of the body, SJR Number 1, a proposed amendment that was recommended to the legislature by the Interim Task Force on Initiative and Referendum. The task force, which I was privileged to serve on this summer and on which I eventually became vice chair, looked at a number of reforms. However, I believe we all agreed that this one before you today is the most significant. And again, it will require a vote of the people. I've said many times in the past that the, the amendments that you send to the people, some of the most, perhaps the most important votes you take in each, uh, uh, in each legislative session. This measure is designed to add additional protections to our state constitution, the foundational political document of our state. There are a number of reasons why this is a necessary change at this time. Three changes in the last 25 to 30 years have necessitated this measure. The first is the introduction of paid signature collectors. In the early days of our history, even before constitutional amendments could be, uh, the process could be started by the people, when the right of initiative and referendum was first approved in the state, remuner remuneration for petition circulation was disallowed. The idea behind the process was the desire to accommodate genuine grassroot vol grassroots volunteers who would acquire the signatures, not pay others to do this work. However, in the late 1980s, because of court cases in other states regarding this very practice, these legitimate prohibitions on paid signature collections, co collections were ended. This change imposed by court decision and not by a will of our people has significantly changed the process of genuine grassroots signature collecting and fundamentally altered this process, especially for amendments to our Constitution. A second significant change is the importation of, these pay, of paid individuals into our state to secure the needed signatures to place amendments on the ballot. In testimony from the Secretary of State, uh, we learned that residence requirements and voter registration requirements for signature collectors, uh, which many would seem, which, which, which would seem very reasonable to many, are not, were not allowed to stand and are very hard to enforce. Again, these basic rules, to which most people would seem to be very reasonable, have been struck down by courts. 
This eliminates the ability of states who have a history of practicing direct democracy to protect themselves from outside forces that seek to influence and control the political process, but do not live with the consequences as, as they reside far away. Again, these two changes, paid signature collectors and the importation of individuals from other states to accomplish these tasks have distorted our process, process which was designed to allow genuine grassroots, homegrown democracy. A third change is the ability of individuals and groups to acquire money from outside the state to influence public opinion once a measure is on the ballot. This is a very difficult area to control as money can be moved from state to state and it is difficult to track and regulate. I am not sure that such a restriction on money from other states is legitimate or possible. However, there is one method that is clearly constitutional that states can use to protect their constitution. That is what is being proposed in this amendment. This amendment, which if approved by the legislature, would be voted on by the people. It will set a higher standard for passing any constitutional amendment in our state. And this possibility was confirmed in a 1997 Supreme Court decision, Brady versus Omen. In that case, the decision which was affirmed, again, by the United States Supreme Court, it maintained that states have the right to prevent the, use, the, the uh, abuse of the initiated process and make it difficult for a relatively small uh, special interest group to influence things. So again, the requirement of a supermajority was challenged. It was upheld by the United States Supreme Court. This measure is patterned after a similar amendment recently passed in Colorado in 2016. The voters in this nearby state with similar ballot access laws like South Dakota decided in 2016 to support an increase in the standard of approval for any amendment. We should also guard the most fundamental political document of the state from those who would seek alteration but who in many instances will not be bound or controlled by these alterations and have no stake in our state. Again, we cannot eliminate signature collecting. We cannot effectively enforce residents, we cannot eliminate paid signature collecting. I'm going to state that again. Again, we cannot eliminate paid signature collecting. We cannot effectively enforce residents' requirements for signature collectors. And the regulation of out-of-state money is difficult at best. However, this proposal is legitimate and, and a desirable method of protecting, again, our, fund, our most fundamental political document. Florida has also in recent years increased the level of approval needed for approval of amendments by public vote. Now I know that some will want a higher threshold, perhaps 60% rather than 55. I introduced both ideas to the task force and found much more support from its members for this level rather than 60%. The 55% level was backed by members of both political parties who were on the task force. It received strong support and it was passed by an 11-2 margin I would ask for your support for this vital change that will go to the people. Republicans, Democrats, and our summer chair, who is a registered libertarian, all supported this proposal. I trust a strong majority of this body will as well. I want to thank you for your time, and please vote yes on this proposal. I appreciate thank your time. Thank, thank you, you again. Thank you very much, Senator Boland. Senator Nessaba, good afternoon again. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, may I ask a question to the prime sponsor? Yes, sir. Please proceed. Uh, was this bill written in part uh, in in response to uh, to Marcy's law that uh, that became law back in uh, 2016? Senator Boland, do you care to answer the question? Uh, yes, I, I would say uh, certainly not exclusively. That might be a partial reason, but uh, there are numerous reasons why uh, uh, this bill was was this idea was brought forward, and clearly it is my uh, my idea. Uh, I would say my one regret, a Senator, in this whole proposal is that I, uh, I did not uh, bring this measure a number of years ago. In fact, one of, the, uh, one of the things that I learned when I first came to Pierre uh, was I did not realize, I did not realize that the legislature itself could just put an amendment on the ballot uh, by, uh, by majority vote, and of course that's not really uh, uh, the issue here, but uh, I have a firm belief that uh, uh, the ability to change the Constitution and that document itself must be guarded and protected in a diligent fashion. Thank you. Senator Nessaba, you have the floor. Uh, thank you. Uh, th 
the problem is that if this was brought in part to, uh, to address the problem of Marcy's Law, was that Marcy's Law passed with over 60% of the vote. And so even if this measure had been in force at that time, uh, it wouldn't have prevented Marcy's Law from, uh, from, um, from taking effect. And so your solution to that problem doesn't match. Uh, you would still have the passage of, Ma of Marcy's Law. Senator Bull, and I think that was still part of the question okay. colloquy. Th thank you. First of all, I believe if I heard correct, you said Marcy's Law passed with 68% of the vote. S okay, I must have misheard then. Uh, I would say again that uh, that that is again was certainly not the only, uh, uh, by no means was that the, the main or the uh, uh, principled reason for bringing this. The, uh, the fundamental reason is because uh, I believe our Constitution needs to be protected and uh, I also would say that uh, the passage of this will very likely also, and I think one thing you're leaving out, good Senator, is that there will very likely be a change in behavior, could very well be a change in behavior of those who would oppose such measures because they uh, will have the, uh, they will be able to grasp that their, uh, their efforts, which would probably be futile uh, against, uh, in, in trying to just to get uh, one more than half, would perhaps succeed in another, with another standard. Thank you, Senator Ness, but you still have the floor. Yeah, I would just respond to that. I, I, I agree with you, and I am concerned about out-of-state money and, and out-of-state influences, but I fear that raising the standard to 55% actually will crowd out grassroots uh, movements. It will become far more difficult for ordinary citizens to put a measure on the ballot. What's going to happen is the grassroots movements are going to get put down and you're going to have more out-of-state money, more out-of-state circulators. You're going to make this problem worse by raising the standards because the only people that are going to be able to play is going to be big money. Thank you. Further remarks? Senator Russell, did you? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President, members of the Senate. <clears throat> I've struggled with this greatly because I believe that the motivation behind this um, and a number of the other bills that were sponsored by this particular committee are designed to have a chilling effect on the ability of regular South Dakotans of going out and participating in their government when the legislature either fails them or special interest has too much influence on the process that we have here in this uh, capital. I, uh, I, I, I note with some concern the, uh, the statement that uh, what brings this is an abuse of the process. Um, when I think what the real genesis of this act is, it wasn't necessarily Marcy's Law, I don't believe, because as it's been pointed out, Marcy's Law passed by a large percentage, much, much larger than what we're talking about here. I think that the, the genesis of this legislation had to do with, of course, the amendment last year that um, I am 22, and then the response of this body to I am 22, which I thought was wholly inappropriate. And because of that, I have struggled with uh, a concept that generally I would be in favor of, and that is, is that we're protecting our Constitution from manipulation, um, potentially by big money. But again, I, th I think the point is well taken from the member from Sioux Falls that what this does is it makes it more difficult for the little guy to participate in the process not necessarily the big money people, because they, according to the United States Supreme Court, have a right to free speech. And that's why they struck down provisions very similar to this. The, I am going to vote for this, and the reason I'm going to vote for it is because I believe that the people of the state of South Dakota deserve an opportunity to weigh in and on this matter. But, I think our motivation and the motivation of this task force in bringing a number of these bills may very well preclude a lot of these things from, and this may very well be a good idea, but my fear is, is that 
because of our actions in the last legislature of eviscerating and totally disregarding the people of this state through the election process, that good ideas like this may very well fail. Um, and we may very well, like I said a year ago, when we were debating the entire repeal of IM-22, that it would come back as a constitutional amendment and will be revisited on us in great proportion. And it'll be something that we won't be able to touch. And my fear is, is that bills like this coming on the heels of what happened, what we did here on this floor last year, bills like this will be perceived as an assault on the right of the people to participate in their government through the initiative and referendum process that this state was the first in the entire country to enshrine in our constitution. So we need to be careful in my estimation when we overreact to what the people have done because the ramifications of our actions here at the ballot box may be much greater than we could have anticipated. I hope that I'm wrong. I hope that this has a chance because I do believe that we need to protect our Constitution. And I hope that the people of South Dakota, in my vote, don't perceive me as having a knee-jerk reaction to try and quell or to chill the people's participation in the system that was enshrined into our Constitution. Mr. President, I support the bill, but I have great trepidations about the timing in which we are acting here today. And I hope that the people of South Dakota do not perceive my affirmative vote as a vote to in any way dissuade them or try and chill their ability to participate in our government through, those, through the referendum and the initiative process. Thank you, sir. Further remarks? Senator Heinert, Matakupi, how? Matakupi, Mr. President. Well, I'd just like the, the body to know that, you know, this came through our committee, and I, I listened to the good senator who, who brought it, and I, and I believe he, he is truly uh, doing what he thinks is best to, to protect our Constitution. But I, I oppose this at a, on a different level. So right now, in order to get a constitutional amendment, uh, people have to go out, gather about 50,000 signatures, you know, and then submit them to the Secretary of State's office. They'll go through them, see who's valid, and, and kick out some signatures. And if there's enough signatures, it'll go to the ballot. Uh, the people will vote on it. That's not what's happening in this case. It passed committee with six votes. It could pass here with 18. It could pass the House with 35. That's 60 votes, and this will be on the ballot. Not the 50,000 signatures that everybody else is required to do. So I, I oppose it on, on that alone. Um, I don't think it's right. If they would have went out and got the 50,000 signatures, and the people of South Dakota said, yes, this is an issue, we want to vote on this, I would support it. But that's not what we're doing here today. Um, and don't forget the irony of this. We put this on the ballot. It could pass with less than 55% of the vote and become law. So there's another, that's another issue I think we need to take pause when we consider this. Our state motto is, under God the people rule. It's not under God 55% of the people rule. Pilamia Apollo. Pilamia. Senator Monroe, good afternoon, sir. Beautiful day in your fair city. Yes, it is, Mr. President. Welcome, everybody, even those from out of state. <laughs> Speaking of which, Mr. President, geez, I can't do a thing right. Well, we don't need germaneness. What, what else do you have to say? What? I, I uh, Mr. President, I, 
I am voting for this bill because we're being influenced so much by forces from outside South Dakota. There are initiatives I feel have nothing to do with what people in South Dakota want. I don't believe there was any discussion previous to the introductions of these, these um, ballot initiatives and things like that that had anything to do with what happened in South Dakota before or was discussed in South Dakota before. The reason I'm doing, the reason I'm voting for this bill, I would make, like to make it in instances like that, instances, far more difficult to pass this because you've got it because if the out-of-state influence has 10% in that vote because of postcards and TV ads, then I think we should be able to absorb that and get it back to what was fair, what was uh, actually happened in the minds of the South Dakota voters. I, I don't have make any bones about why I'm voting for this bill. If it was, if I knew that the influences and the thoughts and the actions and on these initiatives, things like that, were coming from inside South Dakota, 50% would be just fine with me, and more fair. But it's not. We have to compensate for things that come from outside uh, with agendas. So, thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Senator Monroe. Further remarks, Senator Partridge. Question for the sponsor. Please. State your question, please. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, were the people of South Dakota always able to initiate a constitutional change via the referendum process to change our constitution? Was that always the case? Okay, the, the question actually, were just because there's so many students, the question is solely about the initiative process, not referendum. Please proceed. Right. Uh, well, thank you. Uh, thanks for the question. The answer to that is no. Uh, it was only uh, in a vote that was taken in 1970, uh, becoming effective to the best of my knowledge in 1972, that the process, again, of beginning, and I try to use that word beginning rather than initiating because then that moves away from confusion between initiative and, and constitutional amendments. It was only in 1972, after a vote in 1970, that the public could begin the process of starting and beginning the process of amending the Constitution. Okay, does that answer your question? Senator Partridge, you have the floor, sir. Well, thank you, Mr. President. I, I'm not a history major, and I appreciate the answer to that question because I was thinking that there was a change there. But I, I think the rationale for the start of our state not allowing this or not allowing it when the good senator from Hot Springs talked about us being the first state for initiated measures, not constitutional, is that the Constitution is very important. It's understated, obviously. But I mean, it is crystallized in my mind that our Constitution is of vital importance to our state. The, really, the, the defining difference between a democracy and a republic is a constitution and changing it should be somewhat difficult and should be make us all take pause the the difference between a a simple majority of votes over man and woman versus the protection of the minorities rights is the constitution the difference between free elections and free elections with free elections with a rule book is the constitution and so changing the Constitution should be something that is uh, taken not lightly and something that is very, very important to the state of South Dakota as our history has been presented as such. And so I support this bill. I support the thought process that went into it, the committee that produced it, and I would ask for your favorable consideration of it. Thank you. Thank you. Further remarks? Does anybody wish to speak before Senator Nelson will speak? Senator Nelson, good afternoon, sir. By the way, um, again, there are students here, and uh, some of them have left, but we're using the term bill, and it's a resolution, a Senate joint resolution. Please proceed. Thank you, sir, and thank you for that reminder. My illustrious genteel colleagues, citizens of South Dakota, I ask you, whose constitution is it? The constitution is the people of South Dakota. It is not this body, it is not the governor, it is not the Supreme Court. It is the sacred document of the people. Why do we have that constitution? That constitution is a leash 
of the people on us. It is there to keep us in line. Now, I rise in a very difficult position of opposing what my well-spoken colleague from Hot Springs so eloquently placed was appears to be the motives for bringing this. The sting to the voters of the repeal of a measure that they brought to deal with problems that they see pervasive in our government still stings across this state. And rushing in on that still bleeding wound, here we are bringing this to now change it so it's more difficult for the people of South Dakota to address problems they see in our great state. And we do so by solemnly saying we're doing this to keep out the out-of-state money. Well, let's be frank. Um, I welcome the National Association of Gun Rights money in the state of South Dakota to try and help uninfringe South Dakota and Second Amendment rights. I also welcome the NRA. And more importantly, I wholeheartedly applaud and beckon any money from those who want to support the right to life. So let's, let's be clear. I happily embrace that money coming into the state to address problems that we have here in our statutes and our Constitution. More importantly, if we look back over history and we look at the fumblings and the crimes against humanity that our own representative government has committed while trampling on our sacred document and the principles therein, we had a Supreme Court and a Congress that for hundreds of years said that it was legal and constitutional to enslave our fellow man. It took my great-grandfather and his generation to oppose the declaration of war against this union by those who were committed to expanding slavery. It took Congress how long to pass the, the 19th Amendment giving women the right to vote. The only reason why I am going to support this and vote for this is because it is the safety valve that needs to be in check on this institution and our state government. That is the wise and benevolent people of the great state of South Dakota. At the same time, I would caution them from changing their state constitution to require 55%. The realities of our current situation in the state is more and more we are seeing the state of South Dakota change dramatically and move to the left. That scares me to no end. The only recourse that may be available to the people in the future is to have the Constitution available to address that. I think it is short-sighted to try and change our Constitution at this juncture in time when it has served us so well. And, and let's be frank, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. We're only here because people didn't like the fact that people across this great state rose up with I am 22 and Marcy's Law and other measures. I may have vehemently disagreed with I am 22, but once it was in statute and once it was passed, I was duty bound to support what the people of South Dakota had passed. More importantly, we're duty bound to protect the Constitution. So if anything makes it out of this hallowed body today to the people of South Dakota, I'm telling them that I'm supporting this out of respect for their rights to decide, but at the same time, I'm cautioning them and urging them to defeat it on the ballot. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Rott, and good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon, Mr. President. I would remind everybody that what we're talking about here is not a motion. We're talking 50 plus one, one vote. Federally, if we had a great kumbaya moment where both chambers unanimously passed to amend our Constitution, it comes back to us, the 50 states, and it takes 34 of us 
to say yes upon that. It is incumbent upon us to defend that Constitution. Now, I am one that goes, would have went with a, a much higher bar, but I have learned up here one thing. It is not the best bill that gets passed. It is what is possible, five percentage points. And yet the feds, our great Constitution, we go far beyond that. And yes, it takes us decades to get that Constitution amended, but it also keeps us out of a whole lot of trouble because only the best ideas survives. And that's what we're talking about here, the best ideas. So I'll be voting for it. Thank you, Senator Kennedy. Good afternoon, sir. Thank you, Mr. President. I would urge my colleagues in the Senate to defeat this resolution. I'm a bit of a student of history, but it doesn't take a degree to remember that the Constitution that we're talking about was adopted when our founders created the state of South Dakota in 1889. And our founders recognized that things might change as time went on. And they included a provision in the Constitution to authorize amendments, and to authorize amendments by a majority vote of the citizens. I listened to the reasons given for this suggested change. And as I heard those reasons, they really have nothing to do with anything other than a frustration with the fact that times have changed. And we no longer live in a little vacuum out here in South Dakota where we're isolated from the rest of the country. We are influenced every single day by news media, by money, by advertising, by campaigns that come into our state, that come into this room to try to influence our votes. This isn't going to change that. You know, the fact that a few people may have been hired to go circulate petitions doesn't mean anything because the amendments were a result of the votes of the people, not a result of who got the signatures to put them on the ballot. I look at it this way. Frankly, I think, and I will disagree with my good friend from District 19, I don't think you vote to put something on the ballot for the people to vote on and then say, vote against this. Because I think if we put this on the ballot, it is inherently an endorsement in the eyes of the public of this idea. And I think we need to think very carefully about whether we want to endorse this change to the Constitution. I'm not so arrogant that I think I know that every decision I make today or here, despite how hard I may try to do the right thing, is going to be the right decision 20 years from now. And I don't want to tie the hands of my children my grandchildren, the future generations that come and say that our decisions and the ones that came before us are so good that you can't change them unless you come up with a supermajority. I appreciate the frustration that people have with out-of-state money and big, powerful people being able to influence decisions. But let's not kid ourselves. It happens to us. We see it here every day. We have to fight against it, but it's here. And as my friend from District 19 pointed out, that's just a few of the national organizations that are sending us proposed legislation, sending us emails, sending us all sorts of things to try to influence what we do. The fact that that happens doesn't mean we have to do what they ask or do what they say. And I don't think the people of South Dakota are any different than us. 
I frankly think it's kind of demeaning that we would look at the voters of South Dakota and say, we don't trust you to use your independent judgment and to see through the influence that out-of-state money brings. So I think this is a bad idea. And I would urge my colleagues to reject it, leave the Constitution the way it is. It's worked since 1889. I don't think we need to change it now. Thank you. Does anybody wish to speak before Senator Boland speaks in rebuttal? Uh, Senator Sutton. Well, thank you, Mr. President. And uh, I'm not going to belabor the point much. I just wanted to hit a couple issues that were discussed here as far as it relates to out-of-state money. Let's be clear, this isn't going to do anything to limit out-of-state money. In fact, I would contend it's going to give out-of-state money more power. Uh, there was also discussion about protecting uh, our Constitution from the people. But I think we need to ask ourselves, who are the people that we're protecting? They're our voters. South Dakotans, not out-of-staters. South Dakotans get to vote on, on this issue. So I would urge you to defeat it. Thank you, sir. Senator Nessaba, did you wish to speak a third time? Okay. I, I do, Mr. President, thank you. Uh, and a, a question for the, uh, for the sponsor of the bill, Mr. President? Please, uh, resolution, yes. Or the resolution, I'm sorry. Yep, please. How many times has our Constitution been amended since, uh, since statehood? Senator Boland, do you care to answer the question? Uh, no, I do not. Senator Nesaba, you have the floor. The point I was going to make, I think the number is about 120, but I think many of those, and, and, and maybe this good senator knows, many times that it has been initiated by us, by the legislature itself, because the legislature needed to go back to the Constitution to ask permission from the people to do something. One of our ongoing issues in South Dakota is about workforce development. And a couple of years ago, before I was here, uh, many of you in this room decided that what we really needed was we needed to, to really address needs of technical education. And you put, together, uh, you put together an initiated amendment. You put it on the ballot. It got voted on. It got about 51% of the vote. And, uh, and now we have a new tech board. And we're trying to address this problem we have in education in South Dakota because our tech schools are twice as expensive in South Dakota as they are in Nebraska and Wyoming. And I'm glad you all passed that measure, and I'm glad that 51% of the people voted for that. But if Senator Boland's proposal had been law at that time, we wouldn't have that new tech board. We wouldn't have that flexibility. I think that uh, this idea that we know the future better than those that will come after us and that we're going to hold them to a higher standard than the one we've been held to, I think is a bad idea, and I urge you all to vote against this bill. So thank you. Thank you. Senator Boland, closing, please. Very good. Well, thank you, Mr. President. We've had a good debate. Uh, I appreciate the comments and uh, statements by people on both sides of this issue. And again, I do want to say uh, I firmly believe, and I've said this for six, seven years, as long, pretty much as long as I've been in the legislature, the, voting on these uh, these joint resolutions is, is probably the most important vote you take. I just want to make a couple of points very quickly. This has nothing to do with initiated laws. This has nothing to do with referendums. This has only to do with the constitution of the, uh, of the good straight, great state of South Dakota. I urge your support. Uh, let's pass this on. Thank you very much. Thank you. Further remarks, hearing none, the question for the Senate is, uh, final passage of Senate Joint Resolution Number One. Those in favor of passing Senate Joint Resolution Number One will vote aye. Those opposed nay. Madam Secretary, I'll call the roll. Senator Boland. Aye. Kamak. Aye. Cronin. Aye. Kurd. Aye. Ewing. Aye. Frerichs. Aye. Greenfield. Aye. Haverly. Aye. Heinert. Jensen? Aye. Kennedy? Aye. Killer? No. Klum? Aye. Kobeck? Aye. Langer? Aye. Maher? Aye. Monroe? Aye. Nelson? Aye. Nessaba? No. Netherton? Aye. Northrop? Aye. Otten? Aye. Partridge? Aye. Peters? Aye. Rush? Russell? Aye. Soholt? Aye. 
Solano? No. Stolzer? Aye. Sutton? No. Tapio? No. Tiedemann? Aye. White? Aye. Wick? Aye. Youngberg? Aye. Curd? No. Mr. President, there are 26 yeas, 9 nays. Senate Joint Resolution Number 1, having received a majority vote of the members elect, is hereby declared passed. Any title questions? Is approved then. Okay, second reading of House bills. We have one House bill to debate. House Bill 1057, an act to authorize the Board of Regents to contract for the construction of the Madison Cyber Labs, Mad Labs, and the demolition of Lowry Hall at Dakota State University to make an appropriation therefore and to declare an emergency. House Bill 1057, having received a second reading, is up for consideration and final passage. Senator Youngberg, good to see you. What a great topic for you to talk about. That's right. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, House Bill 1057, I'm going to read off of this piece of paper because there's so much knowledge that comes out of this institute, I couldn't fit it in my head. So that's where everybody's supposed to laugh. Here. <laughs> okay. Hey, perfect, perfect. What does this bill do? This bill authorizes the construction of the Madison Cyber Lab on the campus of DSU and demolishes and the demolition of Lowry Hall, which is the site of the new building. An emergency clause was included in the bill, enabling the demo and construction to begin upon passage of this bill. Um, an over, uh, overview of the Mad Labs. We've been at work on this for a couple years now. I don't know if anybody knows I've been involved in this topic in this in this great chamber. Uh, Mad Labs is designed to build on DSU's current and expanding capabilities in the, as, the cyber, as a cyber leader by establishing a career for cybersecurity and cyber operations research and development in South Dakota. This research and development hub will stimulate economic development by drawing cybersecurity students and professionals to DSU and by giving them compelling reason to stay in South Dakota to study and work in a variety of interdisciplinary areas. Um, <laughs> the economic impact will spread to the state, region, and beyond as the lab will create partnerships with other regions, schools, government agencies, businesses, and industry. Um, there's, there is an emergency clause on this um, that will, for passage of this the way we'd like, we'll need to allow that. The emergency clause will need to be passed so that we can start the construction as soon as possible. So um, I'd, I'd be open to any questions. This is a great this is a great opportunity not only for Madison District 8, but it's a great opportunity for the state of South Dakota in its whole. Um, I would appreciate full passage of this bill, and I'm open to any questions. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, sir. Further remarks? Yes, uh, oh, excellent. <coughs> Senator Maher, thank you. You didn't let me down. Do you have a question? Or? I have an amendment. You have an amendment. Just to, just food Even for better. We'll just do that, or you know, an oral amendment, absolutely, right? Absolutely. Okay. On uh, line three. Yeah. Before the word Dakota. Yes. Insert the word South. Okay. And on line seven. Yep. Before the word Dakota, in, insert the word South. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Comments on the motion to amend. Okay. Comments, Mr. No, President. No, no. Comments by the on the motion to amend. I, I would just, I would view this. I'm um, sorry, but you are more than out of order. Really, it's his amendment. Oh. Well, yesterday we tore down a building at that particular campus. I believe they've got some open space available that we would no longer need to tear down another building at the former university. Cost saving. Yes, absolutely cost saving. Oh, it's just um, comments uh, on that uh, motion to amend, Senator Youngberg. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I would view this as one of the most unfriendliest amendments out there and, and would urge your resistance on this. Well, it is in indicative of the fact that you are new. <laughs> they get more unfriendly. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Mr. President. Yes, uh, Senator Bunny. I'm sorry, Jack Rabbit. I'm well, sorry, that was disrespectful tonight. That's definitely, they used to call the women's sports teams bunnies, so they changed it now to just Jack Rabbit, so. Just a point of clarification. I'm sorry. But I want to thank the good senator from Butte, Corson, Dewey, Harding, Perkins, Zeebach, and part of Montana <laughs> for bringing this amendment. 
but I would urge the body to not pass the amendment. It's in the wrong location. We don't have a Lowry Hall up there. But if I may speak to the bill, no. Mr. President? Okay. All those opposed to that amendment say no. no. Fails. So, Youngberg, you know, that's why you have me in pocket, buddy, okay? This is a very significant learning day for you. <laughs> Senator Tiedemann, do you wish to speak to the bill? Thank you, Mr. President. Yep. Yes, I would like to speak to the bill. I think the bill demonstrates where Dakota State University has really come. They, with the change in mission, they're doing more and more with the, the cybersecurity, using the computers and technology in the classrooms. When I was at a Midwestern Higher Education Compact meeting, an individual from North Dakota stood up and said, well, you know, when we go to hire people that work at Microsoft, I go to Nebraska, I go to Iowa, I go to Minnesota, I go to Wisconsin, all great states. And he never mentioned South Dakota. So I posed a question to him. I said, have you ever driven down I-29? And I knew he had because he used to come down to Brookings when their football team played down there. I said, that is a di diamond in the rough. We have students graduating from there that are leading the nation in technology. This just elevates it to the next level. I urge support of this bill. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Peters. Thank you, Mr. President. In all seriousness, I do want to also add, uh, lend my um, support to this particular piece of legislation. Coming from Madison and spending a good chunk of my childhood and adult life supporting Madison and the economic development engines that are driving that city, uh, they are, they're cruising and that particular university is going places with some of the new missions that they're, they're developing. Uh, they are dr driving policies um, across the nation when it comes to not just cybersecurity, but a lot of the, a lot of the computer software and a lot of that. So, with that, I'd, I'd really urge your support and uh, support the city of Madison and their and their university. Thank you so much, Senator Peters. Senator Stalzer, good afternoon, sir. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, early December, I was uh, invited to a cybersecurity conference from uh, NCSL, and our key speaker was Dr. Griffiths from Dakota State University. Um, when I retired, I was replaced by a DSU grad. When I started in that job, nobody had cybersecurity or internet as even a training program. But Dakota State University is a very, very important thing to our state and our nation in its uh, cybersecurity program, and I would very much urge your passage. Thank you. Thank you. Further remarks? Hearing none, it does have under other fund authority as an appropriation uh, proposed as well as an emergency clause and therefore requires a two-thirds majority vote for passage. Question before the Senate is final passage of House Bill 1057. Those in favor will vote aye. Those opposed nay. Madam Secretary, please call the roll. Senator Bolin? Aye. Mack? Aye. Cronin? Aye. Kurd? Aye. Ewing? Aye. Frerichs? Greenfield? Aye. Haverly? Aye. Heinert? Aye. Jensen? Aye. Kennedy? Aye. Hiller? Aye. Plum? Aye. Kolbeck? Aye. Langer? Aye. Mahar? Aye. Oh. 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 Monroe? Aye. Nelson? Aye. Nassiba? Netherton? Aye. Northrop? Aye. Otten? Aye. Partridge? Aye. Peters? Aye. Rush? Aye. Russell? Aye. Soholt? Aye. Solano? Aye. Stalzer? Aye. Sutton? Aye. Tapio? Aye. Tiedemann? Aye. White? Aye. Wick? Aye. Youngberg? Aye. <laughs> Yes. Mr. President, there are 35 yeas. I'm not sure. Um, there's been a disturbance in the force here. Um, did, would you read uh, Senator Mahar's vote? What was that? Mr. President, I believe it was a yay. 
Hmm, confusion you are now. <laughs> okay, well, uh, House Bill 1057, having received a two-thirds majority vote of the members elect, is hereby declared passed. Okay, that's our business for today. Senate, would you please welcome Orrin Sorensen, former representative from Garrison. Good to see you, Rep. And on behalf of Senator Tiedemann, we have AgFest tonight, 5.30 at the Ramcota. There's also at uh, uh, Ramcota, I know, uh, community support, support, support providers and other announcements. Senator Boland, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Senate Ed, tomorrow, 7.45, we have four bills up. Thank you. Rocking and rolling. Uh, Senator Wick. Thank you, Mr. President. We're going to be hearing bills in your joint Committee on Appropriations, and we'll get started at 8 a.m. tomorrow. Very good. Bill hearing. Any other announcements? Senator Russell. Judiciary will uh, meet at 7.45 tomorrow. Thank you. Senator Kamak. Senate Ag will meet at 10 o'clock. I believe we have five bills. That's excellent. Again, we go in at 1. Does that mean any other announcements on caucus would be moved up an hour? Uh, Senator Greenfield, yep. Uh, yes, Mr. President, thank you. I believe that is true of the Republican senators. And also I would note that the South Dakota Newspaper Association's lunch has been moved up an hour to begin at 11 o'clock instead of noon. Thank you. Very good. Any other announcements? Senator Jensen. Thank you, Mr. President. Commerce, 10 o'clock tomorrow. Very good. Anyone else? A very good day. Motion to adjourn. Senator, no, Senator Youngberg is going to move that we Whoa. adjourn today. I thought he already did that. He wanted to do it again? Okay, geez. That's, okay, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed, day. <laughs> Motion carried. <laughs> we are adjourned. Well done.